Shall we pray? Dear Father in Heaven, thank you for allowing us to assemble here on the first day of the week to sing these songs of praises unto you and in a moment to uh, partake of these emblems and then hear a lesson from Brother Ben. Dear Father in Heaven, we um, thank you for answered prayers. You have answered many prayers for the sick of our number. And we still have a number of people on our sick list, and uh, we pray that you would continue to put your healing hand upon them and ease their pains and heal them if it be thy will. We pray that for the ones that have serious health issues, and um, we know that you will touch them. Be with the ones of our family that have lost loved ones and help them during their troubled times. We um, thank you for this congregation and body of believers. We thank you for the elders that lead us and the deacons that do their work. And we just pray and give thanks for the outreach of this church through this to this community and 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 in the um, mission field. Uh, go with us now through this worship service, and we pray that it will be acceptable on our side. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. <coughs> Psalm 
Let us pray. Dear Lord, we're so thankful and so blessed for this beautiful Lord's Day morning that you have given to us. and Thankful for the opportunity to gather here this morning and worship you and to sing these songs of praises to you and to gather around thy table. Just please be with us as we take part of this bread, which in the Christian mind represents Christ's body that was shed for us on Calvary's cross. And let us all take it in a manner well pleasing to thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord God in heaven, as we continue our remembrance of thy Son, bless this fruit of the vine, for to us it represents Christ's shed blood on Calvary's cross. Help us to partake of it a manner pleasing unto thee, and always mindful of the sacrifice made for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Dear Lord, thank you for this beautiful day you've blessed us with. Thank you for the rain that you blessed us with and the beautiful sunshine this morning. Thank you for the life that you've given us and all the many, many things that we have. None of it could be without you, Lord. Help us to give back a small portion of what you so richly blessed us with. Help us to do it in a way pleasing to thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and sing song number 589. Song number 589. To Christ be royal and be true. Today's scripture reading comes from Revolution 7, verses 9 and 10. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Brother Ben. Well, good morning. good morning. It is good to see everybody here this morning. It's great to have our visitors with us. We're always happy to have you here with us. And uh, as always, we want to encourage you and invite you to come back and spend time with us in the future. We're always happy to have you here. And uh, we'll be back again this evening at 6 o'clock and then Wednesday evening at 7 for midweek Bible study. And we'd love to have you come join us for those. Did you all notice anything different about me when I walked up here this morning? Huh? 
Not that I'm saying anything, but did you all notice anything? I got rid of the brace this week. It's the first time since the end of March I haven't had a brace on. They do have a big uh, a tight wrap on the top and a full compression sleeve that goes all the way down to my ankle. So I've still got some aid there, but I don't have the brace anymore. And I've got to be honest with you, when I went in Tuesday and she said, we're going to get rid of that brace. Where you're, she told me I'm like three to four weeks ahead of where she thought I would be with my therapy. And, uh, you know, I said, well, it's, I, you don't know my church. They've been praying for me, and they, uh, it's, I, I believe in the power of prayer, and it's working. And I've also been working real hard to get rid of that brace. But then after it was all said and done and she took it off, I went home and I told Brenda, I said, you know, as much as that congregation has done for us over the last couple of months with this leg issue, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed that the brace came off that fast. I feel like I owe them at least another month in the brace. <laughs> But uh, now, thank you all so much for everything that you've done. We are on the man. I've still got a long ways to go. Um, she said it would probably be at least a year before I was back, you know, pretty, <laughs> pretty much abnormal or however you want to put that with me. But she said it would be a while. But uh, I want to thank everybody, though, for your prayers. And uh, we have a lot of people in the congregation that are having a lot of difficulties right now and um, some very serious difficulties. And I want to beseech all of you, please, to keep all of these folks in your prayers. Everybody that's in our bulletin, we've had a lot of surgeries recently. We've had some that have lost loved ones. We have some that are in ICU. We have some that have procedures coming up. We just, we have a lot going on for our small congregation. And uh, I would like, if you would, this morning, let's start out with a word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that you give us in this life. And Father, as has already been mentioned and prayed for, we want to pray for them again. We have so many in our congregation and a list of them that are having difficulties, Father, and we just pray on their behalf. And Lord, we just ask that you would be with them. We, we pray for uh, Tammy at this time. We just lift her up to you, Lord, and we ask that you'd be with her and that a donor would be found for her and that we just pray for, for her and Kip and for courage and for strength during these days. Father, we pray for Bradley at this time. We just ask that you would that you would be with him and the difficulties that he's facing and everything that's going on there. Lord, we pray for those doctors and nurses that are attending to him, and we just ask that you, would, that you would let them use the skills that you have blessed them with that would restore him to his health if it would be your will. Father, we pray on behalf of each and every one of those that are having so many difficulties. We pray for, for Norma this morning and for that entire family and the loss of her sister. Father, we just ask that you would comfort them and strengthen them. We pray for each one of those that, that faces these difficulties, Lord, that you would be with them. We believe in you. We believe in the power of prayer, and we have seen prayer work. And, Father, we, we thank you and we praise you for prayers answered and for the things that you have done that, that we see in tangible ways in this life. So many that we have had that have been having difficulties that are healing now, Father, we thank you for that. Lord, we just ask that you'd be with us in everything and be with each of these and be with be with all of us as we go through this service and through our lives. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So please be sure to keep all of them in your prayers. We are back on our series that we started a few weeks ago. We started a series on the parables of Jesus. And we took a little bit of a break last week because it was Mother's Day. And uh, if you remember a couple of weeks before that when we started the series on the parables... I said, no, I know Mother's Day is coming. I'll find a parable that I can work in there for mothers on Mother's Day. And I abandoned that and did something else. We didn't even do a parable last week. But we are back on the parables this morning. And we are going to look at a parable that's found over in the book of Luke. If you've got your Bibles with you, open them up over to Luke, the 14th chapter. We're going to start there here just in, in just a second. Um, I've got uh, down up there that we're going to start in the 16th verse, but we're actually going to go back a verse and start in the 15th. And we are going to look at a parable that Jesus tells that applies to us in our lives today. But at the same time, when Jesus told these parables, one of the things that we need to do is we need to take the time out to look at the context in which this parable was told and, and these stories that he's telling. The, the context involves who is he talking to? What was taking place at the time? Where were they at? What was the point? Because Jesus never told a parable that did not have a specific point. And all of the parables that he told were typically to a specific audience during a specific time within a specific event taking place. This parable that we're going to look at this morning 
we need to have a little bit of background to it before we actually get into the parable. Because if you notice, it starts about halfway through the 14th chapter of Luke. Well, there's a lot of things that are happening in the first half of that chapter that we need to understand. What is taking place is Jesus has been invited to a dinner at a prominent Pharisee's house. Now, if you remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about Pharisees. They were religious leaders of the day. They were the religious leaders for the Jewish people at that time. They were supposed to be the moral compass. They were supposed to be the spiritual guide. They were the most powerful people in Israel at that time. Now, Jesus has been invited to a, a dinner at not just a Pharisee's house, but the Scriptures over in the first verse of chapter 14 tell us a prominent Pharisee's house. So he's been invited to a lunch or a dinner at this leader of leaders house. And when Jesus gets there, as always, the Pharisees have an agenda. The leadership has an agenda. Their agenda is all throughout the four Gospels to catch Jesus, to trip Him up, to get a way to charge Him so that they can have Him moved out of the way. They literally want to kill Him. And they're always looking for ways that they can trip Him up or trick Him into something. And when this Pharisee invites Jesus to his house, they have their agenda going on. At his house during this meal, there also happens to be a man there who is stricken with dropsy, which is a fluid retention disease. And this man is in horrible shape. They didn't have the, the medical facilities back then that we have today to go get the fluid off. And it was very often a fatal disease. And this man is there. Now this tells us right off the bat that the Pharisees have their agenda and they're setting a trap because it is the Sabbath. It is the holy day to the Jewish people. Keep the Sabbath holy. And they have brought Jesus in hopes that Jesus is going to heal this man on the Sabbath and then they have a charge against him. You're working on the Sabbath. You're doing the wrong thing. You're not supposed to be doing anything on the Sabbath. But Jesus doesn't take the bait. What Jesus does is He turns the tables around on them. When He comes in and He sees this man that's ill, He asks the Pharisees, is it right to heal somebody on the Sabbath? And then without even an answer, He goes straight into, He says, which one of you would have your oxen fall into the well and you wouldn't get it out on the Sabbath? Or which one of you had a son that would fall into a well on the Sabbath, but you wouldn't get him out? Of course you would get your son out on the Sabbath, of course, because he's your flesh and blood and your loved one. Of course you'd get your oxen out on the Sabbath because he's your financial uh, gain. You're going to lose a lot of money if you lose your oxen. So you'd be willing to break the Sabbath to pull your oxen out of a well or to pull your son out of the well. But you're going to try to hold me accountable for healing somebody on the Sabbath and making them whole. And at that, Jesus heals this man. And right after he heals this man, he goes into a sermon with these Pharisees and these Jewish leaders, he goes into this sermon about humility and about putting others first and about how to treat others and where our position should be and where their position should be. Now remember, he's talking to a group of the Jewish leadership. He is talking to the Pharisees. He is in the house of one of the leaders of the leaders. And he's telling them all these things. And when he finishes this lesson on humility and on self-sacrifice, and on putting other people first, he goes into this parable, starting in the 15th verse. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell all of those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said, I've just bought a field. I must go see it, so please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. The owner of the house became angry, became angry and ordered his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and into the alleys and into the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, What you have ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, Go out to the roads, the country lanes, outside of town. Go out and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. This is a great parable. 
This is a fantastic parable. But you've got to remember the context in which it's given. This is a parable in which Jesus is talking to a specific group. It's, it's a parable that is designed for a specific group in a specific time. He's at a feast. He's at a meal at a prominent Pharisee's house, at a ruler of rulers' house. And he's seen that the way that they've been acting, and he's seen what they've been doing. And after he gets done giving this lesson on humility and on self-service and on putting other people first, one of those at the table, and if they're at the table, they're a leader. Because Jesus has just got done talking about how he looked around and saw how they were all seated. The ones seated with prominence are at the table. So this man at the table, one of the most prominent of them, comes out after Jesus says that, after he gives this lesson on humility and he says, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Now do you want to know what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and other group of leaders and, and the scribes and, and all of the religious leadership of Israel at that time, do you want to know what they thought? They thought that they had an automatic ticket in to that great feast, to that eternity with God because of how righteous they were. And if anybody ever asked, they didn't hesitate to tell them how righteous they were. And they wanted to show everybody how righteous they were. And Jesus just finishes this discourse on humility and on putting other people first. And this Pharisee or this leader that's sitting at the table says, Well, blessed is the man, in other words, me, and all of us religious leaders that are sitting at the table, that will feast at God's table in the kingdom. And Jesus says, Let me tell you a parable. Now here's the parable. There is a rich man who gives a great banquet. And he sends out invitations to everybody. And in this culture at this time, the invitations were going out to the rich and the powerful because he's a rich, powerful man. They wanted to hang with their own. And he sends out invitations to everybody. And then he tells them, come to the table, the feast is ready. But all of them come up with excuses. They can't come to the feast. And he says, well, fine. If you're not going to pay attention to my feast, if you're not going to do what I've asked you to do, I'll bring in the crippled and the blame and the blind and the poor. And when that's not enough, he says, I'll go outside the city limits. I'll go bring in everybody that's living homeless out there and the foreigner, and they'll come in, and they will sit at my table. And notice how Jesus ends that parable. He says, I tell you right now, and, and, and the interesting thing is, as Jesus is telling this in the third person until he gets to the end of it, the 21st, 24th verse, I tell you not one of those men who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. Now, this is a specific parable to a specific group at a specific time. Let me tell you what the parable is about to the group that Jesus is talking to. He's telling all these religious leaders and all of these Pharisees that are gathered around the table, the rich man is God. The invitation's been made to you. You religious leaders, all of you Pharisees, all of you religious leaders, all of you, you spiritual moral compasses for the nation of Israel, the invitation's been made to you. But you have turned that invitation down. And do you know what's going to happen now? Is this invitation is going to go out to everybody that you think is not worthy to have an invitation to the feast. You want to sit there at that table and say, Blessed is the man that will feast with God in his kingdom. And hold up your wine goblet and say, Because I know I'm one of those. Let me tell you something. You're not going to be there. None of you sitting at this table is going to be there. But this invitation is going to go out worldwide. And the ones that you think that are less, they will be there at that feast. And boy, you think that didn't punch those Pharisees and all those Jewish leaders right between the eyes? And it's easy for us 2,000 years later to put that all into context and then say, boy, Jesus got them there, didn't he? He laid it right on them there, didn't he? But doesn't this apply to us today? Let me tell you how this applies to us today. Because you can take this parable. Jesus taught and did so many things while He was alive. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us He performed so many miracles and did so many things that if they were all written down, there's not enough books in the world to contain them. He did a lot of stuff. But what we have is we have this collection right here that God saw fit to see that we got 2,000 years later. This is the really important stuff that came down to us. 
This parable is in here for us as Christians 2,000 years later for a reason. It wasn't just specific to those Pharisees. And it applies to us as well. Now I want to tell you three things this morning about this parable. Number one, number one is the problem. The problem at that time was the Pharisees were so self-righteous. They had built themselves up to think that we've got the golden ticket. No matter what, we're going to heaven because we work harder than anybody else for it. We have Abraham as our father. And we follow all the rules and regulations and guidelines. And we work and we work and we work and we work and we work. And the Pharisees were so crazy about the law and so crazy about working so hard that they figured God's law wasn't quite enough. When God gave them the Ten Commandments and gave them all the laws that He gave the nation of Israel, they said, we'll add to it. We'll make our righteousness secure. We'll even add more to that. What God said was keep the Sabbath holy. What the Pharisees said was, you don't do anything on the Sabbath. Did you know that the Pharisees added to God's law? They said, if you wore a prosthetic leg or arm, if you had a wooden leg, according to the Pharisees, you could not put your leg on and walk around on the Sabbath. You know why? Because you were carrying a burden and it was a work. So you had to just sit around without your leg on all day on the Sabbath or else you were sinning according to the Pharisees. That's not what God said. Well, what the Pharisees had done is they had taken God's law and they had worked it and worked it and worked it and they had decided we're the only ones that are even keeping this burdensome law that there's no way that they could even keep. And we are working our righteousness and working our way into heaven. And Jesus, for His entire ministry, is pointing out to them that God's not impressed at all. You're working yourselves for nothing. Because you really can't work your way into heaven. So that was the problem then. Now, 2,000 years later, you know what the problem is today? The pendulum has, strung, has swung. In the world of Christianity today, overall in the world in Christianity today, especially in Western culture, and particularly in the United States, the pendulum has gone from being a Pharisee and thinking you have to work yourself to death to get into heaven and to be righteous and to get God to notice you, it swung all the way over here to where in Christianity today in the Western Hemisphere and particularly in the United States of America, I ain't got to do anything. I don't have to do a thing. I'm completely saved by faith and grace alone and once saved, always saved. And since I've been once saved, always saved, I don't ever have to do anything ever again. I don't need to pay any attention to God because... I've been set free. I've been set free from that law. And the Bible tells us we've been set free from that law. But what we've done is, in our culture today, we have taken Christianity to this side of the pendulum so far over here that now, as, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, not so much those that are here, but, but as a whole, in the general idea of Christianity today, it's, I really don't have to do that much. I've been preaching 26 years, and if I had a dollar for every time I had a debate with somebody about the fact that you really need to be paying attention to God, you need to be in church, you need to be reading your Bible, you need to be praying, you need to be worshiping, you need to pay some attention to God. And if I've had once, I've had a, a million times, like I said, if I had a dollar, I could be a rich man right now, for somebody telling me something along these lines. I was saved when I was 12 years old at Bible camp. And once saved, always saved. I can't lose that. We went so far to the other extreme, the churches are empty and the ball fields are full. Churches are empty and the golf course is full. The churches are empty and the lake is full. The churches are empty and the sports complexes are full. Because we went to this whole other extreme that we don't need to do anything. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. Once saved, always saved is probably one of the most dangerous spiritual doctrines that has ever been preached because people get it in their head that they really don't have to do anything. And that is as dangerous as what the Pharisees were doing 2,000 years ago. So here's our problem, is the fact that God does call us to do certain things. Look in your Bibles, if you will, with me, over to the book of Matthew. Look back in your Bibles, back to the book of Matthew. Look back to Matthew, the seventh chapter. Matthew, the 7th chapter, starting in the 21st verse. Matthew, chapter 7, starting in verse 21. 
Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name did we not drive out demons? Did we not perform many miracles? And I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I fear for a lot of people that are so ingrained in the fact that I really don't have to do anything. And there's going to be a day that we're all going to stand before that judgment seat. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. When we go and we stand before that judgment seat, we're not going to be able to stand there and say, but Lord, 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 I forwarded that post on Facebook. It had your picture on it. And it said, please forward this if you're not ashamed of your Lord and Savior. So I forwarded that. I'm going to let you all in on a secret. Jesus ain't on Facebook. He doesn't have a Twitter account. He's not sitting next to his father on the throne in heaven right now with his laptop, his iPad, or his smartphone checking to see what your Facebook status is. Now, I'm not telling you not to forward that stuff and not say it because I am all for encouraging things. I write encouraging things on Facebook for our church all the time. I am all for encouraging things. But don't do that just thinking that, you know, hey, I've proved that I'm a good Christian. Folks, what we have done is we have went from from Pharisees 2,000 years ago where we're just working ourselves to death to prove our righteousness to a spot in our culture today where I just don't have to do anything. And here's Jesus saying, you know, there's going to be many on that day. The ones that love me will obey me. The ones that do love me will do my Father's will. They'll follow and they'll do the things that I ask them to do. Now here's the thing, folks. If you are truly saved... If you are truly a Christian, if you've truly come to Him, why wouldn't you want to do the things that He's asked us to do? Why wouldn't we feel compelled to show that love to other people? Why wouldn't we feel compelled to worship Him? Why wouldn't we feel compelled to read His Word and to learn more about His will for us? Why wouldn't we feel compelled to spend more time meditating on Him and His Word? Why wouldn't we feel compelled to spend more time with the body? When you think about all... We do it for each other all the time. When somebody does something nice for us, do we not feel compelled to try to return the favor somehow? You know, everything that's took and... Take, took and <laughs> there's some good English for you. Everything that's took in place, everything that's taken place with me in the last couple months with this leg, and all the cars, calls, cars... Y'all didn't buy me a car... But if you want to, my truck is 12 years old. But uh, no, all the calls, all the cards, the gift basket, the food, all of that, it just compels me to want to be with all of you. I want to be around you. I want to reciprocate to you the love that you showed to me. And we all do that. When somebody helps us, we want to reciprocate and, and give back to them because they've helped. Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. And our mental attitude in the year 2019 has got to the point, that was pretty nice of him to do that, but that's all that needed to be done, and I appreciate that. I don't really need to do anything else. We should be compelled to want to be with his people. We should be compelled to want to do his will, to do his, his, his things. And when you go through there, I, I couldn't tell you how many times I've had that discussion with people, and they say, well, you know, I don't need to go to church to worship. I worship in my own way at home. I couldn't tell you how many people I have had, and I would be willing to bet in the higher 90 percentile, they're not worshiping at home. I don't need the church to study my Bible. I can read the Bible myself at home. Well, yeah, you can, but you gain a lot more insight when you've got a group of people that are sitting around discussing it. Why would we not be compelled to be together and to do the things that He's asked us to do? He asked us to be a lightning rod, to go out there in the community, to help the poor, to help the sick, to lift up the downtrodden. As a group, we do that so fantastic. And we may do that individually, but as a group, we do it wonderfully well. 
So, you know, this pendulum swung all the way over here on the other side where we've kind of got the attitude in the year 2019. I'm, it's all good and I'm fine. And folks, that attitude, when it comes down to it on the day of judgment, it's not going to cut it. God still wants us to be active for Him and working for Him and obeying Him and living for Him. So number one, that's, that's the problem. And then the second thing is, is the excuses. Now I want you to think about the excuses that these guys give. The rich man says, all things are ready, come to the feast. And the first guy comes out and he says, I can't come because I just bought a piece of property and I need to go check it out. How many of us here have ever bought a piece of property without looking at it first? The chances that this guy bought a piece of property blind, that somebody just walked up and said, listen, i got 100 acres of land. Oh, here's the money, I'll buy it. And I'll look at it later. Oh, well, today's the day of the feast. I'm going to look at this land I already bought. No, you don't do that. You go look at the land. You check it out. This is what I'm looking for. It's got good water. It's got good grass. It's got a perfect place for grazing. This is exactly what I want. And then you bargain the price. You haggle it around. Then you buy the land. Rich man says, the feast is ready. Come to the feast. Oh, I need to go look at that land. What do you think happened to it? Do you think it disappeared? Do you think something happened to it? No, it was just an excuse. Then a second man comes along and he says, well, I just got five yoke of oxen. I need to go check them out. I need to go. I'm looking forward to this. Rather than be at your feast and rather than eat your food and drink your wine and enjoy your company, I want to go yoke up my oxen and plow some ground. I can't wait to get to work. Really? Seriously? It was just an excuse. You can't yoke up those oxen and try them tomorrow. And then the third one, the third one's the only one that's got a halfway as reasonable excuse. <laughs> if you read the New King James Version of that, and the Greek actually renders out to where it doesn't talk about a newlywed, it talks about, I have a wife. <laughs> the third guy says, I've got a wife, I can't come. <laughs> and of all of them, that's probably the most valid excuse. No, honey, I don't want to go over there. Yes, ma'am, we're not going. But no, it's a horrible excuse. And the, and the way that it renders out in the NIV, and, the, and I believe the King James also talks about, I'm newly married, you know. I've got some other obligations, some family obligations. So they've got all these excuses, and you notice what these excuses are? One's stuff. i got some new land, and I want to go play with it. One's the job. Oh, I need to go plow some with my oxen. And another one's relationships. Oh, I need to go hang out with the family. I can't come to the feast. I don't have time to spend with you because... I've got the stuff, and I've got the job, and I've got the family, and I've got all these other obligations, so I just can't get there. Well, the truth is, you know, excuses just aren't very good. Look over to the book of Luke, close to where we started. Over to the book of Luke, Luke the ninth chapter. Luke the ninth chapter, starting in the 57th verse. Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 57. Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, which is Jesus, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. It doesn't go into any detail, but you read between the lines. That guy went, Okay, well, I'm going to go back home where there's a bed. But it goes on from there. Then Jesus says, He said to another man, Follow me. But that man replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now those sound, that sounds very harsh on Jesus' part. That this guy has came up to him and he said, and Jesus has said to him, Come and follow me. And the guy says, Let me go bury my father. And Jesus says, Let the dead bury their own dead. To us, we're thinking... You know, father just passed away. Let me at least go to his funeral and then I'll come follow you. But that's not what's going on. In the culture of the day here, when somebody said, let me go bury my father, what it was was, my parents are elderly and let me take care of him until he passes. It might be six months, might be a year, might be a year and a half. Who knows? He may have good genes, maybe another 10 years. But he's elderly and I need to take care of him. Let me take care of him until he passes. And then the other one comes along and the other one says, well, let me go back and tell my family goodbye first. Jesus says, you, you don't start out with me and then turn around and go back. Put your hand to the plow and, and go. And follow me. Your job is to go out and make disciples. Spread the word. Do what I've asked. Follow me. 
This is what I've asked to do. And these three guys, they all come up with these crazy excuses. And none of them are really any good. And we come up with crazy excuses all the time today. And when it comes down to it, folks, most of the time, they're never any good. Not never. Sometimes we have good reasons. Sometimes we have an ox in the ditch. Sometimes we have a child in a well. But overall, we just come up with excuses for not following him the way he asks us to. And then the third and the final thing that I want to talk about this morning is that invitation. Think about the invitation that was made because it's very interesting if you read it. This is a dual invitation. There's two invitations made here. At the beginning of that story, Jesus says, a man was going to prepare a feast and he sent out an invitation to all his people. He went out and told all of his people, I'm going to prepare a feast, send his servant out. Our master is preparing a feast and you are invited. But then there's a part two invitation. This is kind of like a save the date card. Only the thing was, in ancient Judea at the time, they didn't do time and clocks and days the way that we do them now. He didn't send his servant out to say, my master is going to prepare a feast. It will be ready at 5 p.m. on Friday evening. What he did, what, what they did, and this was custom at the time, the rich man would send his servant out to the other rich people and say, my master is preparing a feast. Be ready. And I'll be back when it's done. And maybe the next day or maybe two days later, they will have slaughtered the cattle. They will have prepared the meal. They will have brought the wine in. They will have got everything ready for the feast. And then he says, all things are ready. Go get the people and tell them to come. Part two, invitation part two. And the guy goes out and he says, the table is set. Come and eat. And they say, well, you know, I said we would, but not going to now. Because you kind of took me by surprise. I end every sermon that I have ever preached in the same way, with an invitation. And do you know what that invitation is? That invitation is for you to give yourself to Jesus Christ and give yourself to Him and to become a part of His family. But in a weird way, that invitation is kind of like the save the date thing. Because you're being invited to become a part of His family because someday there is going to be this great feast. And that someday when this great feast takes place, because you have accepted the save the date invitation, it's not going to take you by surprise. And when the Lord comes back and says, the table is ready, come to the feast, we're going to be able to say, praise God, I am ready. I have been waiting for this feast. But if we spend all our time down here ignoring Him and coming up with excuses on why we don't need to, and that, you know, it's all been paid on the cross, so I don't need to do anything else, and I'm good, and, and Jesus doesn't mind how I spend my life now. When that thing, when, when that day comes, what's going to happen is all of those people that we may even think are less than worthy are going to go, and, and I'm afraid there's going to be so many that Jesus is going to stand there and say, you prophesied in my name? You spread my name? I don't even know who you are. I don't recognize you. And how horrible will that be? Do you know what we've done in this life today? What we have done in this culture and in this life today is we have traded the greatest banquet feast ever to be known to mankind. We have traded it to gorge on scraps down here in this life. Jesus said, what would a man give for his soul? Take a look around at the United States of America and look at what people will give for their soul. I will trade my soul for money, I'll trade my soul for alcohol, I'll trade my soul for drugs, I'll trade my soul for sex, I'll trade my soul for property, I'll trade my soul just to get promoted at work. Think about the things that we trade our soul for. We're scrounging around down here feasting on scraps at the expense of missing the great banquet. I'm going to wrap this up this morning with a quick story about a little boy. He comes to town one day, and he's walking through town, and in the drugstore window there's a big poster, big colorful poster, the circus is coming to town in two weeks. And a ticket to the circus is $5, and this little boy, he doesn't have $5, and he runs home and he asks his mom and dad, and they, we don't have $5, but I've got to see the circus, I've never seen the circus before, so he goes out and he works and he works and he works, he finds people, he hauls people's trash, he cuts their yard, he does little 25 cent jobs here and there over the next two weeks, and he gathers up $5. 
And he goes and he buys a ticket to the circus for $5. And the day comes, the circus train pulls in. And they parade the circus animals through town. And everybody lines the streets of town. And the little boy gets there. He can't even see the parade, but he climbs up on a light post. And on top of the light post, he watches the circus parade coming from the train and heading to the big top. There's elephants. And there's lions. And there's clowns. And there's acrobats. And there's flamethrowers and uh, uh, flame eaters. And, and, and they're, they're up and down the street doing their thing while they're heading to the big top. And then the last one of them goes by and the little boy slides down off the light post. He tears up his $5 ticket and throws it in the trash can. You know why? He thought the parade was the big show. He'd never seen one before. Well, that parade was worth $5. He missed the real show inside. Folks, let's not spend our life here and cost an eternity scrounging for scraps in this life that we think is a banquet at the expense of missing the true banquet. And what's really neat about this is Brother Davenport had no idea what I was preaching on this morning. And he sent me his song list for me to put onto the PowerPoint. And we are about to sing an invitation song. And the name of that song is Come to the Feast. And the point of this invitation song is to invite and encourage anybody that is here with us this morning. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ into your life, I want to encourage you to accept Him into your life. If you have, become one of His, really one of His. Be compelled to do the things that He's asked you to do. I mean, think about what He's done for us. And then live your life for Him. If we can help anyone this morning, we want to be able to do that. The Bible tells us that, you know, there are things that we have to do. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Confess His name before man. Repent of your sins and be baptized for the remission of those sins. If you haven't taken those steps... I want to encourage you to take those steps this morning and come to the feast. Let's all stand and sing, please. <clears throat> things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now is spread. Ye famishing, ye weary, come. And thou shalt be richly
Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had to come and worship you, Lord. We thank you for the lesson that Ben brought to us this morning. We we thank you that we have the invitation to the feast, Lord, and we just pray that everyone realize that we have that invitation, but it's up to us to accept it, Lord. We pray, Lord, at this time that you continue to be with all those that are on our list, and we have so many that are undergoing difficulties, those that have lost loved ones. We just pray that you you give them comfort and strength, Lord, and that if it be your will, those that are sick be restored to their health. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray that you be with us as we depart here. We just pray that we give you the glory in all things and that we always strive to be good Christian examples that you would have us to be. When we fall short, Lord, we pray for your forgiveness in Christ's name. Amen.